The nice thing about calculus is that there's only three topics to cover. Limits, derivatives, and integrals. This is the first one, also the shortest of the three. This will take about two weeks. Derivatives is about two or three months. Integrals is another two or three months with a two-month review or a month review before the AP Fest of May. My math might be off a little bit, but uh, you get the idea. Not a lot of time spent on this. The other thing I want to mention is because we did that activity yesterday, we are off from the other calculus classes. So tonight's homework is day nine. It's actually the homework that's listed on the calendar from Monday, even though today is Tuesday. Eventually, in the next couple days, we'll get caught up. But until then, just make sure you're doing the right day homework. Okay, we good? Let's talk about limits. I can get my clicker to work. Now we're good to go. Okay. Uh, quick question. Last year in pre-calculus, did you talk about this concept of limits at all? No. Okay. There was some discussion in the past that maybe pre-calc teachers would address it. <laughs> like in passing. Like somebody was just in the middle of a sentence and said the word limits. Right, but you didn't go in that, you don't, you have no idea what a limit is. Right. You're a little scared right now. Yeah, that's okay. So uh, we're going to look at, first of all, we're going to define a limit. I forgot to include that. But we're going to uh, estimate limits both graphically and numerically. In other words, we're going to calculate them and we're going to get them from graphs. We're going to look at what happens when you can't find the limit in an easy manner. And if you can't find it in an easy manner, then you've got to switch to a non-easy manner. This is going to be bad. I'm warning you up front. There's a couple lessons during the year which I call a guppy lesson. And the reason I call it a guppy, anybody have fish at home? You know when you feed your fish, they see you come over to the tank and you sprinkle food, they just, yeah. right, they just sit there with their mouths open? This is a guppy lesson. At some point you're just going to be like, we'll get to that later. There's a, at least one or two others in the year. And then of course, we're going to try not to melt your brain with the formal definition of a limit. We don't do a lot with the formal definition of a limit, but you should still see what it is so that you can converse about it intellectually. Okay, so let's take this graph. First of all, do you have any idea what a limit is, mathematically and or just what, what does the word limit mean? Uh -huh. basically like seeing what happens as you take a distance and get it as close to zero as possible. Okay, perfect. Couldn't have said it better myself. Okay. As you approach a number along the x-axis, you're going to approach a corresponding y value. Okay, so if you look at that picture, if I approach the x value of 5, what y value do, does it appear I get close to approximately? About 2. Everybody good? Okay, good. What happens if I approach, uh, let's say, 1.5? What's the limit there? Zero, right, because it's a y value. Again, we're approaching an x value and getting a y value. What happens when I approach, oh, about 2.5? So there's a hole there. Does not exist, undefined. 1.5 does you say does it make sense? Okay. DMS doesn't make sense. Usually we use DNE does does not exist, but we can use DMS. All right. So let's look at that function. Uh, let's make sure you got terminology correct. What kind of function is that? No, not quadratic. No. That's called a rational function. Yeah. Because it has a ratio. Most important rule to remember in limits, the first thing you should do is plug and chug. 
And you did that already without my instruction. So for instance, if I asked, when I asked you, what was the limit as x approaches five, you all said, well, it's gotta be two. Well, why is it two? Because if I go to five and go up to the function, I hit somewhere around two. When I asked you about 1.5, you said, well, it's about zero because when you go to 1.5 on the x-axis, you get a y value of zero. When you know the function, the first thing you should do is plug and chug. Okay, you might want your calculators, by the way, because we're going to be doing some calculations here. Okay, so let's get some terminology under control here. This is what's called limit notation. What it means is, what is the limit of that function, that rational function, as x approaches 4? And as it says there, the first thing you should always do, it doesn't matter how complicated the limits get, how easy they are, the first thing you should do is plug and chug. So what happens when you plug 4 into that function? Do the math, please. Zero over zero. How do we feel about zero over zero? Not good. Not good at all. That's a bad thing. Okay. But we satisfied the first requirement, and that is we at least tried to plug and chug. So if plugging and chugging doesn't work, then we have to come up with something else. Now, I looked at a couple people's papers already, and they started doing what I was going to suggest we do, which is what? Cancel things out and factor. Is what would say? Factor it and then you cancel things. Good. Factor it. Cancel it. Good old quadratic factoring stuff. Is it safe to assume that you all knew that there would be some canceling going on because there's a hole in the graph? Yeah. Really? Yeah. Or are you lying? Yeah. You, you knew that? Yeah. Good, good. So your pre calc teacher did at least one thing for it. So your advanced algebra teacher did at least one thing for it. A half. Let's give it a half. Okay, part point, yeah. yeah. Okay, what happens when you factor it? Cancel. Things cancel, right. So we get that. Now what? Plug and chug again. Do it. By the way, that process we just did is called algebraically manipulated, i.e. cancel and factor and all that other fun stuff. Zero over zero again? No, get an answer. 15 seventies? Not uh, Daisy. Okay. Well, what does that mean? Well, notice if we have a picture that looks like that and there's a hole in the graph, the thing to remember about limits is that you don't care what the value is of the function at the point you care what the value is as you get very close to the point. And so one of the hardest things that you're gonna to have to deal with in this class is this concept of getting close to. Especially like when I work with my freshmen, they only think in terms of integers. Meaning things have to be, if they get an answer like three-fourths, they're convinced they did something wrong. Because no math teacher would give them a fractional answer. So they cross it out, they do all the work, they get 50 thirds as an answer, and they say to themselves, it can't be that. It's gotta be something pretty like two. When they don't get two, they have a total brain shutdown. The same thing is true here. We don't care about the value of the function at the point, we care about getting very close. So in calculus, when we say very close, we mean really close. So if you're talking about getting close to the point two, 
We're not talking about 1.5. That's not close. We're talking about things like 1.9 with 24 <coughs> nines. That's close. And so that concept is going to be a little bit difficult for people to deal with. We've got a big honking circle on that graph. And let's say it's at 2.5. The only number that's being eliminated in that picture is 2.5. 2.4999999999 is still there. We just don't have sharp enough pencils or a good enough computer to do that. Does that make sense? Okay, good. Okay, so we did that, we get 15 sevenths. Now, again, there's the notation. The limit as x approaches a, where a is some number, of a function is equal to the limit, that capital L. X is the x value, that's a dumb statement, but you understand, you'll understand why I made that statement in a second. L is the y value. You plug in the x value, it spits out a y value. So the big L is the y value? Big L is the y value, which is also called the limit. How are we doing so far? Easy? Yes or no? Okay, good. Let's make it more complicated. Uh, this isn't more complicated. This is just a graphic representation for those of you that like pictures better. Here's the explanation of what's going on. So I start with some x value, either on the left or on the right, and I start moving x closer and closer to this value of a. Remember, f of x represents the y value. Because that, you know, we change y equals mx plus b into f of x equals mx plus b. And as this thing gets closer and closer and closer, we're getting closer to the y value, which is known as the limit. Okay, regardless of what the function looks like. Even if it has a hole, we can still get a limit. Okay. What about this guy? A, do you know what that graph looks like? If so, sketch it in your notes. If not, Figure out a way to figure out what that graph looks like. You got a graph and calculator, you got Desmos on your iPads. Use something that you can get a picture of what that graph looks like. example, what's the first thing we always do? Plug and chug. What happens when you plug zero in there? <laughs> no good. Step two. Oh, just lost the ability to speak there. Step two, algebra. <laughs> Step two, algebraically manipulate the function. Can I do anything to 1 over x to simplify it? No. No. So then I can't plug and chug again. So now I have to figure out what to do. As I get very close to zero, what does the y value do? Increases to how big? Infinitely big. Beautiful. Are you sure? No. Yes. Yeah. No and yes. You covered both possibilities. <laughs> so you're saying, if I understand you correctly, if I come along here, I get closer, this goes higher and higher and higher. Yeah. yeah. Beautiful. 100%. Everybody agree? Yes. But what's the problem there? It goes downward. If I come in from the other side, now all of a sudden I don't go to infinity, where does this go? Negative infinity. Negative infinity. You think that's going to cause a problem? Yes. Yeah, because some of you might come from the right-hand side, some of you might come from the left-hand side, and each of those directions is going to give you a different answer. That's bad. Okay. So that's the answer to the graph? That's what that like? Well, we haven't done an answer yet. Okay. Okay, we'll get there. I'm just giving you some notation. So now I want to make a distinction between 
Are you approaching that number from the right-hand side, or are you approaching that number from the left-hand side? And this is the notation here. So on the far left, the limit as x approaches a of f of x equals l. We've done that already. However, we've got new notation here. a minus and a plus. a plus means you're coming from the right side towards the value. a minus means you're coming from the left side. And then I stuck some equal signs in there. We'll come back to that in a second. I'm going to say the same thing about four times in the slideshow. But let's deal with the two answers. So what's the answer to this part of it? What happens when I come from the left? What did you say the answer was? Negative, Negative infinity. What happens when I come from the right? Positive. Positive infinity. Do those two numbers match? No. no. If the numbers don't match, then you can't have a limit. Because some people are going to come from the left, some people are going to come from the right. Okay, so this is important. Let me reiterate that. This value has an answer of negative infinity. This answer has a value of infinity. Those things don't match, so therefore this has no answer. We express that by writing DNE, does not exist. Okay. The buzz phrase you're going to use is left hand limit must equal right hand limit. Or if you're feeling fancies in your panties, LHL equals RHL. Right hand limit must match left hand limit. What if the left hand side of that graph curved up like the other one? Good. Then it would be right. So if you graph, for instance, one over x squared on your graphing utilities, you'll get a graph that looks like this. The left hand side is infinity, the right hand side is infinity, and therefore the limit at that point is infinity. If they match, they're good. If they don't match, not good. Okay? How are we doing so far? Good. All right. Let's, uh, let's see who remembers things. Uh, ra another rational function. The top function is a cubic. The bottom function is a linear function. Anybody remember how to factor a cubic? Oh. Okay. So uh, let's have a quick contest. Which table can factor that cubic fastest? Go. You got an answer already? Maybe. Okay, we have a winner. Now, that works great if you have x cubed minus 1. In general, a cubed minus b cubed factors as a minus b times the quantity a squared plus ab plus b squared. And I don't know if you recall this, but the difference of cubes is great, but you can also factor the sum of cubes. How's this one work? A plus B. Uh-huh. Times? Plus A B plus B Say again, I'm sorry. Uh, is it just the same exact thing but change the first one? No. A squared minus AB 
plus b squared. If you want to impress your friends, you can do the following. So this guy, this guy is way old school. A cubed plus or minus B cubed is equal to A plus or minus times the quantity A squared with the plus or minus symbol flipped over times AB plus B squared. Meaning, if you're doing plus, then the first one stays plus, the second one is minus. If you're doing minus, the first one stays minus, the second one is the reverse. Okay. Good. Okay, so, whoa, let me get this mess out of here. So, if we factor that cubic on top, <laughs> The x minus 1's will cancel, which we already know is going to cause a hole. What's left behind is a parabola. And it's a pretty standard parabola. It opens up, blah, 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 blah. Since that parabola is good to go everywhere but that value of 1, we don't really need to talk about it. Because the first thing you're going to do is plug and chug. And when you plug and chug, you're just going to get a value. It's going to split out a y value. But what happens when you put in 1? Well, let's go back to the original equation. Does everybody see that if you plug 1 into the original equation, you get a 0 over 0, that's bad. Yeah. Beautiful. Then you factor it, and you get a quadratic. Plug and chug again, what do you get? How much? 3. Three. Good. Wait, so you factor the x cubed minus 1 over x cubed. And the x minus 1 cancel, and you're left with a cubic. I'm oh, sorry, plus. Okay. okay. So this is the thing that bothers people, is that the original function can't have x equal to 1. It doesn't work. It gives you this weird 0 over 0. But after you algebraically manipulate it, all of a sudden you can plug a value in for 1. Well, that doesn't make any sense. How can I plug a value in for 1 when I've got a hole there? But again, limits are the value as you get close to the number, not at the number. If I go back to the original function, 1 does not work. But again, that's why we're taking a limit. Okay. This ramped up pretty quick. But, um, can you go back? Go back? Sure. Go ahead, babe. So, for, so when I, I did x, I factored out to x minus 1 times x squared minus x plus 1. x squared minus 1 times x squared plus x plus 1. It's plus x? Yeah. Plus, yeah, it's always plus at the end. Okay, and then and then you just plug in 3? No, plug in 1. Remember, x value we plug in. Okay, we're good? Yeah. So that minus sign on the back end, which, which is, never mind. That's what was causing it. Yeah. Okay. okay, good. So now we're good. Yeah. Okay. So now we've got a function that I don't, I mean, it's a rational function. I don't, I don't have no idea what it looks like. You can graph it if you'd like, but we can also do it without graphing. And uh, if you plug in zero, we get zero over zero again. Now the question is, can you algebraically manipulate that puppy? Because you've got two options. If you can't algebraically manipulate Let's back up. If I plug in zero, I get zero, zero. I said that already. If you can't algebraically manipulate it, then we're done. Does not exist. Like the one over x. But if we can simplify that, we would get something that we can work with. Any clues on how to simplify that bad boy? Say again? Uh, perfect. Could you explain that to somebody that doesn't know what the hell you're talking about? What the heck you're talking about? Uh, Sorry, buddy. Like, uh, like the conjugate would just be like, just but it's just like, 
the square root of x plus 1, and then it would be the plus 1 instead of a minus 1. Mm -hmm. So it's like they kind of flip everything around, I guess. Like, but you multiply that by the top of the bottom. Beautiful. Well done. Now, what that's going to do is it's going to keep the value the same, because notice I'm still multiplying by 1. But it's going to get rid of some weird, ugly square roots. Okay. Don't be sorry. Go ahead. Uh, why is both ones uh, positive? Because uh, when you do a conjugate, let's suppose I have um, x minus 1. The conjugate of x minus 1 is x plus 1. Okay. Now, what? why do we care about a conjugate? Because if I multiply this out, the middle term disappears. So I would just get x squared minus 1. So because you leave the first term alone, leave the second term alone, and just change the sign. Okay. Okay. That's all you do. Because again, that middle term will drop out. Change the sign of the last one? Yes, correct. Well, then how come you don't change the sign of the one that's under the square root? Because we don't care what that is. That's just one entity. It's just like the x here. You don't change the sign on the x. Oh. Yeah. So you treat this as that first term. Oh. Okay. okay. Instead of simplifying this algebraically, what I wanted to do is show you another approach, and that is taking numbers, getting closer and closer to that number that's forbidden. We can't plug in zero. But what I can do is start looking at values that get very close to zero. So you start at point zero 0.01, you add another zero, you add another zero, and you start to see a pattern there that the function starts to get closer and closer to some number, isn't that? That number that it's getting closer to is actually the limit. In this case, it's two. This is not a practical approach to solving a limit. But what it is is a method that explains or helps explain what's going on with a limit. It's getting very close to a number and spitting out a value that you normally wouldn't be able to get. Gesundheit. You guys allergic to calculus? Yes. Yeah. It happens. So there's a graph of what it looks like. And you can see that there's a hole there. Okay. There's nothing really there. It's just a picture of what we're looking at. But how, will I, how do I know that I graph it like that? So, I, so my equation, I got x times the square root of x plus 1 plus 1 over x. And then how do I know to graph it like that? I would not expect you to be able to graph that. Okay. Yeah, that's a little fancy. I would just, for people that like pictures, I just want to see. Okay, so we already looked at some that don't work. This is, um, well, I'll ask you, have you seen this graph before? The absolute value of x over x? If you haven't, this is a new mother function for us. It shows up all the time. If you have, this is a new mother function for us. It shows up all the time. If you don't remember what it looks like, then you can just plug and chunk. If x is 1, you get 1. If x is 10, you get 10. If x is negative 10, you get negative 1. What happens when x equals 0? That's bad. Because again, we get back to 0 over 0. So this is going to reiterate what we've already talked about, but give you another example. What's the limit? As x approaches 0 from the positive. How much? 1. As I come in from the right and I get very close to 0, I'm staying at the value of 1. Okay. What's the limit as x approaches 0 from the negative side? Negative 1. Does the left-hand limit match the right-hand limit? No. So therefore, what is the limit as x approaches 0 of that function? D and E does not exist. I don't know any way to algebraic manipul algebraically manipulate the absolute value of x over x. So look at the left-hand limit, look at the right-hand limit. They don't match. Done. We good with that? Okay, good. 
the other stuff I have in this slide is just a derivation of where this graph comes from, okay, which I don't know if you care about. But start with the absolute value of x. I know it's a little hard to see. I'm sorry. And then if you divide everything by x, we get down to that, which is why the graph looks like that. However, I'm a firm believer that most of you don't really care about this, which I don't think you should, and could come up with this on your own. If I just said to you, graph the square root of x, or sorry, the absolute value of x over x, given a couple minutes, you could come up with that. Good. Okay, so we, again, reiterating the idea that the left-hand limit must match the right-hand limit. You can see how important of a concept this is, because I've said it like 14 times already. They have to match. If they don't match, then it's the end. Three things of, that need to be addressed. Okay. Number one, I, I know you can read, so I'm not going to read it to you, but number one is what we already talked about. Right-hand side has to match the left-hand side. However, increasing or decreasing without bound is what we looked at at that problem of 1 over x. It doesn't work if they don't match up. And then we'll see some functions that oscillate. Do you know what the word oscillate means? Yeah. yeah. There are some functions that we'll look at that do something like this. And as you zoom in on that function, it looks identical. You zoom in closer, it looks identical. You zoom it. And that repeats. And since it never approaches any set number, you can't necessarily find the limit. Okay. Now, let's have some fun. So, this is not an easy concept. It's not something I would normally dwell on, but I think it's important that you understand, or at least see it, so that you can talk about it. And I'll give you some hints on what you need to get out of this. In fact, you know what, just put your pencil down, in your pencil. Just, just be a mathematical sponge for a little while. Absorb information. If this were a college calculus course, this would be something that we would spend time talking about and doing all kinds of work with. This isn't a college calculus course. But again, I think it's something, it's something that is important enough that you should at least see it. There's nothing on that slide that we need other than the notation. We change A's to C's, because C stands for constant, and you know the notation. This is what we want to talk about. So I start with this value C, which is down on this x-axis down here. And then I move a little bit to the left and a little bit to the right. Does anybody happen to know what that thing is? Uh, it's a positive it is? What symbol is that? Do you know your Greek letters? No. You can read. That's actually a, that's a lowercase delta. The E looking thing is a lowercase epsilon like it says in the uh, paragraph there. So here's what's going to happen. I'm going to take some little value and move to the left and to the right of C. How far do I want to move? I can make it as big or as small as I want, but ideally, since this is calculus, I want it to be something fairly small. And every time one of those values, c plus delta or c minus delta, hits the function, it's going to come over and generate a new value. So this comes up and comes over here. This comes up, hits the function, and comes over here. Okay. And this is where things get a little fluffy. I pick the delta. I can make it as big and small as I want. I'm also going to pick epsilons. Epsilons are a distance above and below the values of my limit. So you see them up here, here, and here. If you take the C plus delta and C minus delta and go up with it, and you take your L plus epsilon and your L minus epsilon, and take that across, you'll see in that mess that there is a rectangle in there. Okay. That rectangle is called the neighborhood. After I go through all these slides and your brain is completely fried, the thing to remember is, number one, how do you generate a neighborhood? 
You pick a delta on the left and the right, you pick an epsilon above and below, and you make a rectangle, and that rectangle is the neighborhood. In order for a function to have a limit, every value in the distance from C plus delta to C minus delta has to end up in the neighborhood. Okay. So for instance, in this example, it does have a limit there. No matter what value I pick in here, if I go up to the function and come across, I end up inside the neighborhood. Okay. I'll show you what it looks like in a second. And we can do a whole bunch of all that other garbage we sure don't care about. So we're going to go back to here. Let's look at this function. Where is it? That one. All right, get this mess out of here. All right, so I'm going to look at the value. Whoops. Around zero. I'm going to pick a delta. How big of a delta? I don't know. Let's do like um, point, point 0.25. No, small. I'm going to go, I, I would even go smaller than point 0.25, but for discussion purposes, from here, I'm going to go over here and here. Okay, so this is my delta. This is my negative delta. And there are my vertical lines. So deltas are horizontal? You got it. Now I'm going to pick an epsilon, and this is where it gets wishy-washy. I can pick however big of an epsilon I want. I'm going to pick an epsilon up here and an epsilon down here. Come across, and now I've got my neighborhood. It determines where your limits have to be. Okay. So if I pick any value between delta and negative delta, it has to be in the neighborhood. And you see that it falls apart because if I pick something like a value over here, I'm not in the neighborhood. I'm down here. Since it's not in the hit neighborhood, it doesn't have a limit. And again, this is well beyond what we want to deal with. What I'd like you to get out of this is understand what the delta is and how to get it, what the epsilon is, how to generate a neighborhood, and what determines if it works or not. We're going to skip all of this stuff, this inequality, absolute value gunk, and just move on. There are your steps for finding a limit. Okay. I left off a lot of things on there. Uh, I left off crying. Uh, cheating off your neighbor. Oh, what just happened? Oh, boy. Okay. And realistically speaking, what you need is plug and chug, algebraically simplify, plug and chug again. If that doesn't work, then you go to something else. Like you might try drawing a graph if you're a visual learner. The guessing and the praying, it's up to you. And again, we're on day nine, not day ten. Date on calendar doesn't match assignment. Okay, we good? Beautiful. It tells you what the value of the function is as you approach a number. Okay. Okay.